Cyrus, in Cyrus, I'm reading about a really cool scientist. Who was Albert Einstein? By Jess M. Brailer and illustrated by Robert Andrew Parker. Chapter 3. Albert takes a very deep breath and keeps thinking. One is born into a herd of buffaloes and must be glad if one is not trampled underfoot before one's time. Albert Einstein. Getting expelled from school, even a school he hated, was very painful for Albert. He was embarrassed to have failed so openly. He was angry with his teachers. He was disappointed with himself. Yet he was also excited that he would soon see his family. Albert joined his parents and sister in northern Italy. Italy was so different from Germany. Albert quickly fell in love with the country. Italians were so friendly, civilized, and open-minded. For the next two years, Albert went to concerts and visited art museums. Best of all, he had time to read and think. He studied the lives of scientists, including those who had suffered because their thinking had gone against widely held ideas of the time. For example, there was Nicholas Copernicus, who lived from 1473 to 1543, the Polish astronomer. He was severely criticized for stating that the Earth orbited around the Sun and not vice versa. A hundred years later, in 1633, Galileo Galilei, an Italian scientist, was arrested for agreeing with Copernicus. Yet in Albert's time, no sane person believed that the sun circles the earth. The study of other scientists' theories pushed Albert's thinking even further. In Italy, he had the time to write down those thoughts and answer many of the questions he had been asking himself for years. Now, he was a real scientist. He even had his first scientific paper published in a magazine while he was still a teenager. When scientists have new ideas to share, they write about them in scientific journals. That's what it means to get a paper published. For Albert, as for all scientists, getting papers published was very important. It was the only way other scientists could learn about the, his ideas and thoughts. Albert's first published paper was about electricity and magnetism. That was no surprise. After all, he'd been thinking about both subjects for years. But to everybody's surprise, Albert began his paper by disagreeing with something that all scientists assumed was true. Scientists claimed that the empty part of outer space, the part without planets and moons, was filled with something called ether. Scientists had no idea what ether was made of, or what it looked like, felt like, or smelled like. But they all agreed that it was there. Albert disagreed. He claimed that the empty part of space was, well, empty. Albert's first paper did not get a lot of attention. Although Albert was disappointed about that, he should have not been surprised. After all, Albert was a teenager who had been expelled from high school and who was still living with his parents. Who was he to challenge the theories of the world's most respected scientists? However, years later, those same scientists would seek out Einstein's first published paper and marvel at the genius of the young scientist, because Albert was right. While living in Italy, Albert took long walks by himself. Day after day, he hiked in the mountains. His family's business was failing, and Albert worried that he was a drain on his parents, a sponge that took but never gave back. He had lots to think about, and a daily walk and time alone cleared his mind. I lived in solitude in the country and noticed how the monotony of a quiet life stimulates the creative mind. The creative mind. 
he said. Albert made several important decisions during those hikes. He decided to study physics at college. Physics is the science of objects, their energy, and the way they move. After that, he wanted to become a physics professor. To do this, Albert knew that he would have to finish high school, but no school could ever own his mind, which he felt his German high school tried to do. Albert also decided that the freedom to think, to explore his own, own ideas, would always be the most important thing in his life. If he got married and had children, his wife and family would matter to him, of course, but they would never as matter as much, he realized, as his ability to think freely. To some people, that might sound like a selfish way to live. But for Albert, it was the only kind of life that made any sense. Albert re-entered high school in Switzerland, where German was spoken. What a pleasant and unexpected surprise! His new school wasn't like the German high school at all. At the Swiss school, students were supposed to ask questions. Albert especially enjoyed discussing the subject of time with his teachers. How fast does time pass? What is the future? Do we travel into it or is it already here? Will time ever run out? Not only did Albert like his Swiss school, he liked the Swiss people. They were friendly and fair. Albert decided to become a citizen of Switzerland. After graduating from high school, Albert stayed in Switzerland and began college at Swiss Federal Polytechnic in the city of Zurich. Albert had no money. His family had fallen on hard times. An uncle provided Albert with a little money, but it wasn't much. Albert lived in a dark room, ate barely enough, and went without new clothes just so he could stay in school. Still, there were good things about this time. At college, he was making new friends. The other students lovingly would call Albert the professor because he had so many theories and talked so much about physics. One of his new friends was Milova Marek, the only woman in Albert's class. Albert liked to call her Dolly. She, too, was a brilliant thinker. They talked endlessly about physics and music. It was not long before Milova and Albert announced their plans to marry. Without the thought of you, he wrote her in the 1900s at the age of 21, I would no longer want to live among this sorry herd of humans. Upon graduation from college in the 1900s, Albert Albert was all set to become a physics teacher. It should have been a wonderful time in his life. He had his diploma and he was in love. However, he could not find a teaching job. His uncle stopped sending money. Albert's clothes were ragged. His meals were few and far between. His health suffered. Without a job, he couldn't afford to marry Milova. Albert ended up taking a job with the Swiss patent office. It wasn't where he wanted to work, but it was a job. Then, Albert's father died. Albert was devastated. Fortunately, he had Milova, and surprisingly, his job at the patent office turned out to be far better than Albert could have ever imagined. Chapter 4. The Best Years when a person invents something, for example, a battery-powered back scratcher for miniature poodles, the inventor sends a description of the inventor of the invention to a patent office. An examiner looks at the idea. Hmm, what a what a nice idea! How original! And decides if it's really something new or just something oh, that is a little bit different from an already invented gadget. If it's a really new idea, the inventor gets a patent, which means other people aren't allowed to copy it. It takes a very smart person to understand inventions when they're just at the idea stage. Albert was that person. Reading applications for new inventions was like solving puzzles. 
Albert was so good at his job that each day he completed his work long before it was time to go home. He then was able to turn his, turn his attention to the first love, thinking. Imagine what this must have been like for Albert. It would be like a kid going to school every morning, finishing all the schoolwork within an hour, and then playing for the rest of the day. With all that time to think, Albert ended up writing and publishing more scientific papers. In one year alone, he published five groundbreaking papers in a very famous German journal about German journal about physics. A storm broke loose in my mind, explained Albert. So, in some ways, his patent office job turned out to be a lot better than the teaching job that he had already um, originally hoped for. Einstein in 4D. People measure objects in three ways, length, width, and depth. Anything, a piece of toast, a TV, a yo-yo, is so many inches high, so many inches wide, and so many inches thick. These three ways of measuring are known as dimensions. Albert threw in a fourth dimension, time. Albert said that the dimension of time was, an important, was as important as length, width, and depth, especially when, especially when measuring something really big like outer space. To think about the size of outer space, but not the time it takes for something to travel through that space, is like thinking about a song without the lyrics. Something important is missing. With steady work at the patent office, Albert felt that he could ask Milova to marry him. So he did. She said yes, and they were married in 1903. The following year, their son, Hans Albert, was born. Now Albert had the time to enjoy music, long dinners, and long walks with his family. Albert was happy and secure. Confident in his job, he could relax, be more himself. For Albert, that meant dressing carelessly, wearing the same wrinkled shirt day after day, and often forgetting to brush his hair. Why did I do this? As someone once said, Einstein looked as if he'd just smoked an exploding cigar. Albert's years at the patent office were wonderful. He had a family, time to think, and write lots of scientific papers, and enough money. Many of the greatest scientific achievements of the 20th century electronics, the atomic bomb, and space travel were all suggested by Einstein in the papers he published while he worked at the patent office. Those ideas were then worked on further by other scientists in the decades that followed. Then in 1909, the University of Zurich convinced Albert to leave the patent office and become a professor. Albert would actually be paid to teach and study physics. Life was even more wonderful. Einstein's Theory of Relativity In 1905, Albert published a paper about relativity. It said that everything, except light, travels at different speeds depending on different situations. Think about relativity this way. If you look up at the sky, and see a plane in the distance, it doesn't appear as if it is going very fast. You stand there and watch as the plane seems to move slowly across the sky. Yet if you were standing next to it, the plane would zoom past you in a split second. Blam! Boom! Gone! And yet again, if you're sitting inside the plane, it barely seems to move at all. See how the speed of that one plane can look totally different to you in different situations? That was Albert's point. The speed of a moving object depends on how it's being viewed. In a short time, Albert became a very popular professor. College students enjoyed the way he explained difficult concepts with simple images. Think about this image. A man falling freely in the Earth's gravitational field who drops an object will not notice it is falling. 
and Albert loved to lecture. It is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy in creative expression and knowledge. Albert was invited to speak all over Europe. He was a rising star. Albert accepted other teaching jobs that took him not only to Zurich, but to other European cities like Bern, Prague, and Munich. And Einstein thought, before Einstein, Scientists thought that the sun was always in the same place, with the Earth and the other planets orbiting around it. Think of the sun and planets as being like your neighborhood. Your home is always on the same street. Your school stays in one spot. You don't have to, you don't have to wander off looking for these places every morning. Albert, however, shocked everybody by claiming that the sun, the other stars, and the planets Everything, all of the time, are moving through space. Think of a parade with the bands and floats always staying the same distance from each other, but the whole parade is moving down the street. Albert's theories were startling. For example, Albert claimed that light bent as it traveled through space. This surprised scientists who assumed that light always traveled in a straight line. Who was right? Often a scientific theory can't be proven, but this theory could be. During a total solar eclipse, the moon blocks out the sun's bright light from the viewers on Earth. This makes it possible to photograph the light of the stars beyond the sun. Albert insisted that a study of those photos would show light bending as it passed the other planets and the sun. All Albert needed to do was wait about four years for the next total eclipse in 1914. Many scientists were also excited to see whether Albert's light theory was correct. In 1911, plans were begun to send a group of scientists to Russia to test Albert's theory. Russia was one of the best locations from which to photograph the stars during the eclipse. Of course, 1914 was still far in the future. In the meantime, Albert continued to think, give lectures, and develop his eccentric genius style. Hopelessly absent-minded, he often forgot his apartment key even on his own wedding night, lost luggage, forgot to eat, had used money as a bookmark, and then lost the book. He always buttoned just the top button of his coats. Why? It's simpler that way, he said. When Albert shaved, he used only water, which is a very painful way to shave. So a friend gave him shaving cream. Albert tried it, said it was marvelous. Yeet! And then went back to using water. Why was that? It's simpler that way, he replied. Questioned about his odd look, he explained, it would be a bad situation if the wrapper were better than the meat wrapped inside it. I mean, a sad situation. It would be a sad situation if the wrapper inside the meat... It would be a sad situation if the wrapper were better than the meat wrapped inside of it. What was really amazing was how Albert was becoming popular with people who had no interest in science. With his wild hair, mismatched socks, wrinkled shirts, and pants that were too short. Albert was not just a brilliant physics professor, he was a personality. His mysterious smile beamed from the front pages of newspapers around the world. A genius who had unlocked the secrets of God's own mind. People who didn't understand a bit of his physics, who didn't know an isobar from an ice cream bar, were fascinated by Albert Einstein. Articles about Albert showed up in many magazines and newspapers. Had TV already been invented, Albert would have been the subject of all kinds of hour-long specials. Famous formula. Warning! Hard stuff! E equals MC squared is a scientific formula. It is so short that it looks simple, not much simpler than 2 plus 2 equals 4. 
That is part of the reason this formula is so brilliant. Albert figured out a very difficult Albert figured out that a very difficult concept could be explained in a very brief way. Make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. E stands for energy, and M stands for mass. Mass is the amount of matter in something. Mass is a little bit like weight. The third thing, C, is for the speed of light. Light travels really, really fast. Ever try to outrun it? You can't unless you're Sonic the Hedgehog. Basically, what the formula says is that when a little bit of mass is changed into energy, a whole lot of energy will be released. That's what happens with an atomic That's what happens with an atomic bomb. An atom is split, mass changes to energy, and an incredible amount of destruction of destructive energy is released. With this formula, Einstein claimed that all matter, from a feather to a rock, contains energy. That's it for today, guys! Make sure you watch out for the next video where I'm gonna read the next chapters. Bye!